Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Outside Insider Podcast here on Philly Sports Network with myself, Liam Jenkins. You know the score by now. All things Eagles related, wrapped up and hidden very subtly in a box of popcorn given to you just as you're about to go and see your favourite film. Free of charge. Don't even don't even worry about paying for it. It's a complimentary gift. If you're new to the show and you've not yet subscribed, this is your time to do so. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, YouTube, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and just about everywhere that does podcasts, including a box of NFL trading cards endorsed by Panini. That's true, this podcast is a limited edition, one of one card with LJ just sat there smiling you, very seductive, smiling you. That's the way we're starting this show. If that doesn't tell you what you're in for, I don't know what will. But there's only one way we can start this off. One, obviously, in a very soppy, massive thank you for all of the support, because that is what my brand is at this point. But it does mean a lot, and seeing the growth of this show has been just really fun. I love trying new stuff. And one of the newest things that we've tried is you'll lean forward, no matter where. Maybe you're on a plane, maybe you're in a car, maybe you're at home, but you're sat up because you know what's coming. We have to start with Eagles Blockbusters, if you are new to this show. This is an entrepreneurial bit of genius from myself that is costing me money every single week. So the concept is, every single show, I read out three cryptic clues in relation to a player currently on the Philadelphia Eagles roster. Now, I thought this would be fun. For instance, we had one last week. I'm not going to spoil them just yet, but one of last week's answers was, when will my son get in the car? The player we're referring to, Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz. All right, so that's the level of thought we're working with. Now, last week's clues were, were a little bit easy, weren't they? We had 17 correct entries. There were some incorrect ones as well. So I decided to ramp up the tempo a little bit, to go Chip Kelly no huddle offence on you, to start throwing Sam Bradford check downs where you just can't stop him. I'm playing hard to get like the person you had a crush on at school that was always going out with the guy that was just a little bit the, the guy you hate that would throw you in a bin essentially, not talking from personal experience at all. So I, I hate to announce this, I really really do, because we had more entries than ever before. Which is, I mean, we had 17 correct. I think there are about 25 overall last week. We had one correct entry. Okay. Now, it's not just the, the, the nature of the entry. It's who won it. So we're going to get into that really quickly. If you've got a pen and paper, if you're aware of what your answers submitted consist of, here are the answers to last week's Eagles blockbusters. The first one was... That sandwich is way nicer than mine. The player I was referring to, that sandwich, ha sandwich, way nicer, sandwich way, that sandwich way, Hassan Ridgeway. That was the defensive tackle we're talking about. Now, a lot of the answers, there were two answers here that people got wrong. A lot of this was Miles Sanders. I get that. Miles Sanders, mine, Miles, I totally get that. That was a 50-50. That may be my smartest move to date on that front. So you'll be kicking yourself if you put Miles Sanders. Some of you are out already. Number two, if the Eagles can't win or lose, they will tie. Tight end, will tie. If the Eagles can't win or lose, they will tie. I'm probably, I'm not going to lie, I'm most proud of that one. That was genius. The third one, this caught a lot of people out as well. There's a trace of oxygen in all living things. There's a trace of oxygen in all living things. That player was trace of oxygen, trace, tray, trace of oxygen in all living things. All living. Trace all living. Trace Sullivan. And we got a few different answers for that as well. So there were no shocking ones. There was no Carlton, Carlton Agadosi. There was no Cody Kessler. But we did have one winner. And the one winner, I clowned on this show last week. He, and even worse, he's my friend. He DM'd me on Twitter the answers and said I had to think like Liam. Because last week, when I read the clues out to him, and he said you know, uh, when will my son get in the car was Carlton Agadosi. I had a little chuckle. And now the joke's on me because I've got to send him a t-shirt. So well done, Connor Hughes. I'm not even going to spin the wheel. You've got every correct answer. 
Unless I've missed one a submission. If I have, make sure you pound the table and let me know. But as it stands, Connor Hughes, you have won last week's Rockbusters. We're now going to move on to this week's set of clues, though. So, if you didn't win last week, well, which is everyone except Connor, don't worry. You've got a chance. I've tried to make the clues a little bit easier this week because having one correct answer isn't fun, especially when it's your mate that's just done it to get at you more than anything. So, question one, Eagles Blockbusters participants... Along the trail, you find a stone. Along the trail, you find a stone. Pause it, make a note of it. Uh, what We're five minutes into this show. If you're on a plane or a car, you can't get to it. Don't worry. Just go back to it a little bit later on. Question two. Finding Nemo meets the Arsenal football team. Finding Nemo meets the Arsenal football team. And question three. This is this is the most fun one. This is up there with they will tie. I've heard that man's blind. Oh wow, I've, I've messed it up. I've heard that man's blind. What? Can't Jay's uncle see? I've heard that man's blind. What? Can't Jay's uncle see? Those are your three questions. If you think you know the answers and you want to win a free Philly Sports Network shirt, which by the time you listen to this maybe being beautifully modelled on the Twitter pages, send me an email, phillysportsnetwork at gmail.com, or send me a DM on Twitter, at Liam Jenkins PSN. Don't leave it in the comment section anywhere, don't tweet it in public, because people will steal your answers, and that's more competition for shirts, we don't want that. So phillysportsnetwork at gmail.com, at Liam Jenkins PSN, get your entries in, you've got from now until next Friday, which if my maths is correct, will be the 21st of June, which gives you a nice window, again, depending when you're listening to. But now that's out of the way, we'll revisit it later on, we'll remind you of the clues, don't worry. We need to get to the Eagles stuff, because it was a fairly big week uh, for a few different reasons. Obviously, mandatory minicamp came to a close, we had a slight front office shuffle, a bit of a... A, a char char slide at the front office. Okay, we're going to get into that. The names in, the names that, well, no names out. And that's the whole point of it. And a bit of a crisscross as well. And of course, of course, of course, thank you next, which is my favourite part of the show. But I want to start with this. When mandatory minicamp first rolled around, it was 19 over. No, I'm kidding. It was assumed that Malcolm Jenkins wouldn't show up. That he'd just, he'd skip it. He would take the $80,000 fine in the hopes of getting a few million dollars in guaranteed money. And hey, that sounds like a good risk worth taking, right? You lose 80k, you pick up a few million, you go and buy yourself. What would I buy with my first million dollars? I don't actually know. Probably the 2019 Motor Trend Ford Chevy 150 truck of the year of the truck. But that's just me. It was assumed that Jenkins would be out. But he, any walks... With John Cena's theme playing in the background, Malcolm Jenkins storms in to the Novacare complex and partakes in mandatory minicamp. Now, he wasn't subtle about it. He made it very clear that he outperformed his current contract. He told reporters he believes he has outpaid said contract and he deserves a raise. And who can really blame him? Again, we don't need to get into statistics because we've done this a million times over in videos, in podcasts, in articles, and what probably feels like me whispering in your ear when you're at work at this stage. (laughs) 1.6% of snaps missed in four years. But again, we're not going into stats. (laughs) We're not not going into stats. Was that most versatile? The safety in the... No, sorry. Just not going into stats there. But everyone's kind of misreading this. I feel. My instant view uh, was seeing this on Twitter was everyone, not everyone, there were certain people, a couple from the media, a couple on radio. That's, yeah, I've got access to Philly Radio now, so that's a thing. But people kind of saying, oh, well, that means how he's won or the Eagles front off his win because they don't need to extend him because Malcolm Jenkins, no, don't be silly. A, the Eagles still have $24 million in cap space even after that monstrous Carson Wentz extension. So there's no reason why they shouldn't pay him. They'd probably just want to conserve cap going into 2020, which is going to be a much heavier year as a lot of those backloaded contracts start becoming front-loaded. But that doesn't mean they can't pay Malcolm Jenkins. So what Malcolm Jenkins has done is the equivalent of being in a relationship or a marriage. Not that I would know the latter, you know, just it's assuming. Assuming makes an ass out of you and me. We're going to do it anyway. 
that you have a bit of a bicker, a bit of a fallout. Maybe you're like me and you've ruined a sandwich toaster. That's a joke. You don't call them sandwich toasters. I think they're like grilled cheese makers. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But one of them, uh, you broke it. You broke the kettle. You've done something. And your significant other is a bit angry. And they're having a go at you. And it's World War Three, And then it becomes one of those arguments that always gets dragged up. Whereas if you have a future argument and you're losing said argument, you bring up the sandwich toaster just to make it level again. And you know they've got no leg to stand on because they broke the sandwich toaster. What Malcolm Jenkins has done is get into one of these arguments and realise that he's not winning. He's not winning. It's sort of like the wife saying, you'll be home by 12, he gets in at 12.03, it's a World War Three level argument. And what Jenkins has done, instead of trying to explain his case for hours and hours on end and going round in circles and trying to, to talk some sense and explain that his train was a bit late, he's gone, you know what? You're right. You're right. I'll take the L. I'll leave it. There are more important things at stake here. Like our marriage. Like our child. Like our relationship. Like the sandwich toaster I'm definitely replacing because I broke it. That's what it comes down to. It's a very mature mindset. Something I wish I had, if I'm honest with you. But that's what it was. Jenkins has gone, do you know what? I can stomp my feet, I can cross my arms, I can post videos on Twitter of me working out in a public park, or I can just turn up to minicamp where my team need me, because without me, Rodney McLeod's still not fully healed, Andrew Sandejo may not be on the team by the time week one rolls around, that leaves Blake Countess, Trey Sullivan, DeAndre, nah, come on, they need me. I was the glue that kept that team together last year. When we go through hardships and adversity, I'm the guy that they turn to. I'm the leader. I'm the guy that is whispering in Jim Schwartz's ear, telling him to make adjustments. This is a bigger picture. I can hold out now. Or what if I miss minicamp? What if I start missing training camp? And once I take this stance, I can't come off it. It's not like one of those things. Once you've swung the sword and that head's partially beheaded, you're not sticking it back on, Malcolm. So he's realised that and gone... It's not worth it. Because if we get to training camp and the guys, I could have helped with development and then there's a play that I could have coached, I could have uh, pointed out something they're missing which they were showing in training camp which I didn't see because I was at home and then it burns us for a late touchdown in week five that costs us a win, that's on me. And that then could cost us a playoff run. Malcolm Jenkins has been extremely mature about what well, that doesn't mean it's not an issue. That doesn't mean that we suddenly wave those contract hopes under the table, but it's part of accepting that within that agreement, within that binding contract he signed, within that marriage certificate, paper, document, within that Tinder bio, if you will, you've got a level of responsibility. People are depending on you now. And you can't selfishly pull out of that just because you feel like the circumstances changed. You agree to a restructure, you agree to a contract, and by some extent, you should be expected to follow through. As a leader, that you were paid to be. Sort of like, uh, this is a very bad analogy, I know, but in my last few weeks at Apple, I took my foot off the gas because I knew I was leaving to be a, a much bigger part of Philly Sports now, to know that my company I've been trying to build off the ground for five years would suddenly be my full-time job. But I realised that I still had a responsibility to Apple. I couldn't let, you know, Doris down, who's 70 and wanted a new iPad set up, and she was freaking out because she didn't know her password. I can't be complacent and kick her out the door early because I want to go home. Because I signed up to be part of that company and follow through on their vision. And that, again, it's just responsibility. And if anything, it should tempt the Eagles to want to pay Malcolm Jenkins even more. Sort of like in an argument where you get home the next day after work and your significant other's like, hey, Liam, I'm re- I, don't- I wish they did that. That would have made my teenage years a lot easier. Hey, Liam, I'm-, I'm really sorry. I was out of order. Maybe I overstepped a bit. Here's some flowers. Sit down. Play a bit of Battlefield. I'll make you some, some noodles. 
that's what Jenkins is expecting now. That the Eagles are going to go, all right, he showed up, he's done his part, now we have to do his. Hell, we rewarded Nick Foles for a Super Bowl. We've rewarded, mi- you know, I would say millions or hundreds, there's literally 90 players on our roster at the minute, but we've rewarded countless players for their play, for their loyalty and dedication. Others have restructured their deals so this could happen. Malcolm being one of them. What makes him different? The centre point of that defence. If we're going to build a culture on rewarding others and not rewarding the guy who deserves it most, then this relationship is going to be turbulent and like in a real relationship, Malcolm Jenkins would leave, find something maybe a bit better that pays a bit more. Well, not all relationships pay more. And be in a better situation for him and his family. That's what it comes down to. It's a very, very mature decision. I was greatly impressed by Malcolm Jenkins this week. He didn't have to. How many times do you see it? In post-OTAs, minicamp. There are guys across the league holding out right now. It was interesting that Julio Jones and the quartet of Falcons players came back. I was expecting a couple of them to hold out. There are guys across the league that are still refusing to go to mandatory minicamp in that almost diva huffy personality that's not Malcolm Jenkins that's what makes Malcolm Jenkins special he's one of the leaders of this team someone that everyone can look up to as a fan as a player as an entrepreneur given that obviously not only does he have a million fingers and a million different charity pies but running Damari Savile his own Philly based business on the side of football You couldn't ask for a more model man to look up to than Malcolm Jenkins. So will the Eagles pay him like it? I I don't know. That's not a question I'm here to answer. I'm not Jeremy Kyle. Uh, I'm not sure what the American... Jerry Springer, I think is... I'm not going to sit here in between that relationship and go, You've cheated on your girlfriend, you're scum, kick her. No, that's not, you know, what we're about here. I genuinely feel as though that everyone... I've not seen one article, one comment, one hot take, one anything that says Malcolm Jenkins should not get a pay rise. And that, when does that happen? When, in Philadelphia sports history, does everyone unanimously, universally get on the same page? It just doesn't happen. Unless they're slagging me off about being tea and crumpets, British high pitch. That, everyone's on that page. (laughs) You just don't see it, though. At all. Hey, the Eagles should extend Carson Wentz. He's the future of their franchise and probably a top-tier quarterback in a few years' time. He's not clearing the playoff game. Thanks, Ben, and go off, Ben. <laughs> Great. Even that, we disagree about. Eagles shouldn't get rid of Nick Vols. That That lasted a month. That was the most stressful month of my life. Trying to just hammer home that... Getting rid of Nick Foles was the only sensible option. That that I know there was a, you know the emotional attachment there, but there was disagreement on that, and what was a very logical situation. They, 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 there was controversy about the Eagles taking Dillard, our Sega Whiteside, Sanders, like all these guys that the Eagles have selected. Why didn't they select a safety? Why haven't they bring in one since? Like, what about Trey Boston? What's happened next? There's always something going on. This is the only time where even. The hottest of takesmen on the Art of the Take podcast who do the best impression of my voice I've ever heard have not disagreed. How is this possible? I don't know. But I think with that in mind, this will probably be the one time the Eagles don't do it and cause an absolute riot because everything's a bit serene. Everything's calm. Just makes sense to, to shake it up a bit, I suppose. But let me know what you think down in the comments, guys, about the Malcolm Jenkins situation. Should the Eagles pay him? How much should they be paying him? It's something we're going to be diving into probably a little bit more uh, over the next few weeks. And what is now the deep breath between mini camp and training camp? But before we get to thank you next, I've got to first plug the, <laughs> the old social media profiles, the old social socials. So if you're not following me yet, uh, at Liam Jenkins PSN, at Philadelphia SN for Philly Sports Network, which is my little baby. Um, not a real baby, I can make after myself. Let's not talk about an, an infant here. But before we get to thank you next, the Eagles announced the other day that there were some, some front office tweaks to account for the changing personnel of Sir Joeth of Douglaston leaving, leaving ship, jumping ship to 
to New York, which is something I think we can all agree we kind of saw come in. If it wasn't going to be New York, it was probably the Texans before they got charged with what appeared to be tampering, which I find fascinating that the only compensation they give up is a first round pick. But if they hire Casario as their general manager and they lose a first round pick, but then you've got a guy that is so good at finding talent and it's like, oh no, we lose a first, oh no, but we've got a GM that's going to make the rest of every move ever worth that loss, so does it really matter? Interesting. But anyway, after a long run, Howie Roseman has finally, finally, finally been given the general manager title, and it just seems like that is the icing on the cake, isn't it? It doesn't mean anything, because he was the de facto general manager anyway. The Eagles even said in their press release that his day-to-day job doesn't change. His responsibilities won't change. He walks in at 5am probably after driving in the Ford F-150, the 2019 Motor Trend Truck of the Year, the only vehicle that any self-respecting executive vice president of player personnel just overall would drive. Um, and he goes home at 9 in the evening in that same F-150. Only the difference is now there is a general manager logo slapped on his door because he's earned it. He is a GM anyway, and it's a nice bit of recognition. I'm all for recognition. My Philly Sports Network little family will tell you that it's something I kind of pride myself on with a ridiculous amount of soppy emails that get sent out throughout the year. But it's just nice to have, considering that he was the GM, gets stripped of his powers, locked in a cupboard, according to Jason Kelsey, for a year. Then he comes to Europe, goes lads on tour, goes to Ibiza, parties it up, goes to Kavos for a bit. Then he goes over to, oh, I don't know, what else is a good uh, Greek island uh, other than that? So you can see how in touch with my youth I am at the tender age of 24, where if I was going to plan a lad's holiday, I wouldn't know. Oh, Magaluf, that's the other one. Magaluf, he, he went there. Looked at some football teams and went, right, now I know how to build a football team. Comes back and is a god. So that's the transformation of how he... I would love to do a podcast on the transformation of Roseman. I remember when I was 20 years old, I actually sent out an email to every conceivable email address I could think of that may or may not be Harry Roseman's. So looking at how the NFL emails are structured and then just put it at h.roseman or howie.roseman or howie.rla, all these combinations, just seeing if he he, he didn't respond, probably because none of them were correct. But I would love to have a chat with him and learn about what he did in that one year away from football because I find it absolutely fascinating. Either way, that's a different tangent, but Howie Roseman is now your general manager the king in the north, he, that's official, done, sealed. The re, the resurrection of Howie Roseman, incredible. Like, he deserves every bit of praise, he deserves the title, cannot complain with that whatsoever. But now, the, the big news, I think, honestly, coming out of all of this, has been who was going to replace Joe Douglas. Who was going to be the guy to fill his shoes? And a lot of people assumed that Joe Douglas being the little sneaky devil he is, was going to snatch away some of the the talent that's hidden within the Eagles' front office. Instead, Howie Roseman, being the three-eyed raven that he is, saw this coming and was like, Andy, a dog, Weidel, Andy in the woods. <laughs> Andy, it's been a Weidel, am I right? <laughs> Get in here, you old, you old little stallion. And uh, he promoted him to vice president of player first, uh, personnel. Weidel's now in his fourth year with the team. He spent the last three years working directly under Joe Douglas. Oh, not not in that way. As the the director of player personnel. So it's a bump up in title. He picks up where Joe Douglas leaves off. Formerly of the the Aussie Newsome staff. When the, uh, the Baltimore Ravens won the Super Bowl back in 2012. That, God, that's 2012. How long ago? That's crazy. But Wydell has been with the Ravens before that. So he's fully entrenched in this Aussie Newsom school of scouting. He was hired by the team in 05 as a West Area scout. And has since kind of jumped up, climbed the radar. And ended up as their East Regional scout before going to Philadelphia. So he's done a lot of scouting work. Especially under Joe Douglas. And if we're talking talent evaluation. Andy Wydell is just the guy that is... If we're talking... What a lot of people seem to uh, perceive as Howie Roseman having a right-hand man and Joe Douglas being responsible for all of this magic and not getting any credit. Well, Andy Wider was his right-hand man that's getting all the credit, that isn't getting the credit, I should say, that Joe Douglas isn't getting 
because Roseman is. So Wider was the only conceivable option other than Andrew Barry. Now, I was an Andrew Barry stan. We'll get to him uh, in just a little bit, the 29-year-old former Browns vice president of player personnel. But as opposed to creating more instability and more turnover and trying, I suppose, just undoing all of that hard work because as Howie Roseman said after hiring, I always keep this quote, um, essentially I've got a backlog as boring as this sounds, but it's obviously imperative to my job, of, of Eagles presser quotes. So every transcript I get, I put into a lovely folder on my Mac, and they're all buried in there. So I just search the word in the transcript, it comes up, and I think it was after the drafting of Derek Barnett, uh, where people asked about the impact of Joe Douglas, and Roseman said that he's changed the way that we evaluate talent, the way that we set our draft board. Essentially, it's all lined up for Roseman, and he just closes his eyes, fires a bullet, and goes, ah! That play, he was on your board, he's good. Right, let's take him. Not obviously, literally, that was a joke. But that's the impact that Douglas had. He changed the way the Eagles evaluate talent, using that Aussie Newsome brand, so to speak. And Andy Weidel, who's been entrenched in that even longer than Douglas, when Douglas was buddying up with uh, with Adam Gaze in Chicago. The, the two now, have, have, I think, are very, very important to this team. They have been since their signing, and Weidel maintains all of those same philosophies, maintains the way they evaluate talent, the way they set the draft board, the priorities. Whereas if you let Weidel walk, and you've got to bring someone else in and coach him up, and maybe they've got their own way, and they want to take risks, because the one thing you're taught as a scout is you hammer the table for a guy if you like him, okay? You hammer the table. Don't be afraid to put your career on the line for a guy. And what we often see is that you you have wild misses in the draft, you have busts, and obviously the wild sleepers as well. Now, there's an element of trust in here. Because if you bring in new scouts and you bring in new personnel, you don't know what... How much do you trust them? It's a whole different ballgame. It's like going back to dating after a few months out. Like, How much do you really trust someone if your last relationship was perfect and it's not going to get better? Are you really going to... Trust someone goes, yeah, yeah, I can come in. Oh, that that guy, that, oh, that guy, Tua, the old Tutu, that's my guy. Are you going to trust him unconditionally? That's got to be earned. And that's where Weidel, who has now had several years within this organisation, will be working with those scouts, overseeing all of that. It makes a, a massive, massive difference. So keeping Andy Weidel absolutely huge absolutely huge don't understand that at all another move was uh ian cunningham promoted to assistant director of player personnel now he again guess where he spent his first nine years of his nfl career it's only the bloody baltimore ravens isn't it so cunningham is again entrenched in that was you some school of scouting blah 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 we know that by now uh, he's another name that i think stands out massively Ian Cunningham is a guy that is going to be rising up that front office ladder. You look at the work he's done with the Eagles as the assistant director of player personnel. That's a lot of responsibility already. Um, And he was primarily responsible with the Ravens uh, in his final four years uh, when it comes to scouting the SEC and the ACC. So he's already familiar there. He then comes to the Eagles. And if you look at where they're taking talent from in the last few years, you can notice a couple of cheeky trends. Now again, obviously his role is going to take a, a very different turn. He's probably not overseeing those same areas now. But seeing a guy like Derek Barnett out of Tennessee, for instance, speaks volumes. Or even Greg Ward out of Houston will be the first one that I look at. And different patterns are beginning to emerge. Like if you look, for instance, this year, there was a really, really heavy emphasis on Penn State. Whether it was a couple of undrafted free agents, whether it was Miles Sanders or Sharif Miller. Heavy, heavy focus. And in years past... That had suddenly shifted to West Virginia. Shelton Gibson, Wendell Smallwood, Rasul Douglas, Joe Ostman, uh, and I was a centre as well. But I'm going to be honest, I had to quickly Google that one. It was Tyler Orlowski, the man I was thinking of. So, I, you know, I could have played the card and winged it, but I would have been here for a couple minutes racking my brain. So, yeah, as you can say, there was a clear focus uh, at West Virginia. So, I think that knowing that those patterns are emerging, you want to sustain that. And promoting guys from within just makes so much more sense. And um, they weren't the only ones. It was a string of moves and just some other ones to really, really bear in on. Max Gruder was a name that has, I think, gone massively underrated as well. Uh, as someone that 
He's coming off a six-year tenure with the Miami Dolphins, five of which he spent as a pro scout, where he evaluated pro players and scouted future opponents. So that's interesting, purely because we know how much the Eagles really value those free agent signings. They value the trades. I mean, look at the way Craven the Blanc was acquired. The captain himself was acquired in a, a very... I'd say interesting way in comparison. It was a mid-season trade. It was the trust of Jim Schwartz into his guys off Harry Roseman and his scout team. So it, a move like that, where you're still going to promote someone or uh, hire them, so to speak, as an assistant director of pro scouting that has that background, that has done it for six years in Miami, that's great. I really, really like that move. Um, again, there are a couple others as well. For instance, Chris Nolan promoted to a player personnel scout. The other big one, though was they hired a quantitative analyst in James Gilman. Now, we're going to go back to school. My little trick for remembering this was quantitative, quantitative, was due, well, associated with numerical research, where qualitative research is normally down to sort of interpretation and different fields and using like loads of empirical data. So it's a bit different, but essentially quantitative research is analytics. It's the way you're looking at numbers, you're dissecting the matrix. We know the Eagles are one of the most forward-thinking teams in the league. They focused heavily on their analytics department. They've now brought someone in as a quantitative analyst. So they're analysing the quantity of the tips. And that is very... All serious aside, that's huge. Um, You see, I think it was the Washington Redskins who have only just hired someone from PFF. And they, they were announced like they were 120th in one of the analytic ranks because they just refuse to adapt it. The Eagles are one of the first two, and they're constantly looking at the ways they evaluate players and changing it. So bringing someone in as a sole responsibility for that job is huge. But out of the 14 moves, 12 of them were promotions, two were hires. And if you're talking about sustaining excellence, it doesn't get much better. I think anyone can look at the last couple of free agency classes, the last couple of trades, trade windows, even the Golden Tate trade, it had the upside, it was done to get the Eagles into the big dance and they were one play shy of going one step further. Um, I think if you look at across the board with the drafts, if you look at the way that talent has developed, the gambles they've taken on injury-stricken players, it all comes down to the guys that had on board and keeping them all in, keeping that same group together. For instance, Katie David is now a director of football operations. Great. I love seeing Katie Weidel, relation to Andy Weidel, now director of scouting operations. Brilliant. You're keeping those same guys in the loop, which is, is brilliant. There's no other word for it. To sustain that success, to be what is now, I think, one of the most appealing franchises in the league. And keep them there. Like you, you're gonna see guys and, and females. I'm not trying to say guys out of a, a generic sense, but we're gonna see staff members, more rightfully said, um, rise up the ranks here and catch a lot of attention because of the nature of this market, because of the nature of this team, and how likely it is to succeed. As a result, that that's sort of why so many people feared that Andy Berry, that Andy Weidel, all the Andys. There's, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a few, would be poached by Joe Douglas in New York because it's a smaller market, which means more room for promotion. Instead, the Eagles just keep that conveyor belt moving and they keep promoting from within and nurturing that culture. That's the thing. It's not a gimmicky New York Jets tweet with Greg Williams where he's saying, like, oh, it's culture over strategy, I think the tweet was. No, this is just culture. I mean, Greg Williams has been on, like, in as many teams as I've changed pairs of underwear in the last two days. In the last... Oh, that was a really bad... I was gonna, As I was saying, I was thinking, this is going to make me sound either really paranoid about underwear or very <laughs> on the opposite end. Um, but yeah, it's it's great to see the Eagles continuously promoting from within. We're going to move on, though, before I babble too much, about the promotions from within. I just love... that. It sounds like a game phrase, like EA Sports promoting from within. Um, But we're going to move to Thank You Next. It's your favourite part of the show. It's my favourite part of the show. And now we move all the way down to what could be one of the more provoking, the most thought-provoking Thank You Next we've had in a while. I've got seven to get through. So Thank You Next. We're going to start with Sean Lamont, who says, If I ask a question, will you answer it on the pod? Sean, I'm sorry. I'm answering your question. I know I've missed it. I promise you I'm not playing hard to get. We're here. Do you see a point either in the off-season or regular season where Maddox takes a CB starting role away from Mills or Derby? Yes. 
I should have just left it there, but I genuinely do. I think that the big wildcard people are overlooking, and there's going to be some more content on this over the next week or so, is the Jalen Mills foot injury. He's been in a boot for it. He was at a boot at a Sixers game. I keep saying boot. That's a really British way of saying it. But towards the end of that season, when everyone's heating up, getting a bit into their groove, Mills has then missed all of OTAs. He's missed all of mandatory minicamp. It's very inconclusive as to A, what the injury was, B, how long he's out for, and see what the rehab time is. Like Doug Peterson has kept that very, very low key. So if he's missing time, the Eagles aren't exactly contractually tied to him. If they're going to release him anyway, or they can't foresee handing him a long-term deal anytime soon, you've got Avante Maddox, who has shown more upside in 16 games than Jalen Mills has in three years. And that's not a hot take. This isn't Jalen Mills saying, so Steph Curry's not a super... This is, I, and I would say, comfortably, I would take Maddox over Mills in most situations. So if you wanna that if you wanna expedite that process, if you want that talent to grow, you want your best players on the field, and I think Maddox has earned it. So it'll be very interesting, but I can foresee it absolutely. Uh, thank you next, Teddy Biriani, one of the first purchasers of the Philly Sports Network t-shirt, says or hoodie, uh, says if the Carson Wentz cap hit for this year is assumedly really low, what's the hold up on Jenkins deal? Good question. Uh, very good question. I think at this point, it kind of becomes a case of either A, is there a major trade in the works with a defensive end, someone like a Jadeveon Clowney that would be, I don't know, I know that's a wild, wild, wild assumption. Is there, is it Duke Johnson? Is there a trade that, that could happen down the line? I don't know. The other half of it is that the Eagles are so badly cap stricken next season. And I know that everyone's now got this opinion where, yeah, well, they're cap stricken every year. Well, yeah. And then Harry Roseman works magic like he's you know, shifting money around like Walter White in Breaking Bad, hiring out a laundrette to make sure he's not cap stricken every year. But eventually, every year that passes, you get a year deeper into those backloaded deals. And next year, I think the exact number is 40 million over the cap hit at the minute. I, I may be mistaken. Don't quote me on that as gospel. I don't have the number in front of me. But if that's the case, that 25 million carrying over is everything if you take that and then the cap moving up a bit they're almost at a dead set then you can work on the bigger contracts then you can restructure then you can attack free agency in the draft so they might just be trying to cut their nose to spite their face they're in no real hurry to extend jenkins they've got him under contract for two more years he restructured his deal willingly they can take that route so i don't know it'll be interesting to see but that can be something. Uh, he also says, also, where's that Capaldi review? He's making the rounds on America late night talk shows and radio stations. He's really on the up and up. Yeah, do you know, I love the way Lewis Capaldi promotes himself. I think, I, my, I was having this discussion with my brother yesterday where he hates him because he's really annoying on social media. And I'm like, yeah, but he's appealing to an audience of teenagers and teenage girls and teenage guys who are either in their feelings, a little bit self-deprecating. It's a very stereotypically British way of doing it right and as you get more exposed to this type of comedy and everyone's becoming a little bit more easier on themselves like I can sit here and talk about my voice because I don't care sort of thing so by doing that and making himself relatable everyone loves him so it's great to see him on he's a marketing mastermind I still not listened to the full album yet if I'm honest I got a bit distracted what was I listened to Oasis a lot recently, so that will be my excuse. I was listening to like Standing on the Shoulders of Giants for a solid two weeks. So there's an album to listen to if you haven't. Uh, thank you. Next, Will Roberts, who would win a hundred meter sprint out of the Eagles players? You've kind of got to say to Sean Jackson, haven't you? Uh, you kind of have to because he's just a bit of a a speedo, not like the the swimming underwear. I think swimming underwear, swimwear. Outside of that, Jordan Mylata would be my, my wildcard guest. Uh, at Mike Marriott, choose one. Oh, Marich. I've got to stop saying that wrong. I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, it says, do, do racehorses know they're racing? Uh, now, I bet on a lot of horses. And I know some of them wear blinkers. And I'm not sure why. Maybe it's to stop them blinking. Maybe it's so they don't see the other horses and they can just run. Who knows? Um, but I think they do for the most part. Uh, thank you next at J- oh, Jaco TM. I feel like Olshon has been super overshadowed this offseason by Djax and Nelly. What do you think his role is in the upcoming season? And is he still a big factor? That is a great question. Um, if I'm honest, it's something I would love to, to dive into a little bit more in depth. Purely because it warrants a deeper answer. 
if we're to look at this as we never know if it was Olshan making these comments, but there was some reported frustration the the Zakat's target share thing and the selfishness. Like, if you draw two and two together, Olshan's a number one receiver, not putting up number one wide receiver numbers. If you're in a selfless thing, that's great, but there's gonna be a part of you being paid like that, you want to produce like that. So again, I'm not connecting that. I just think there is a chance he could be a little bit frustrated or could have been a bit frustrated at one point in time. Now, with regards to Deshaun Jackson and, and then you've got Zach Ertz and Nelly, it's going to be more open than ever. And especially with our Sega White side, you've got Jordan Howard catching passes now, Miles Sanders potentially. I would not be surprised if Ultra and Jeffrey posts 800 yards again this year. Really wouldn't. If, if you're going to pick a thousand yard receiver, Old Sean Jeffrey is suddenly not the name you look at. And I think his numbers could rival Deshaun Jackson. So, in terms of a role, his role when he first came in was opening up the offense. Mainly, that was what it come down to. It was giving defenses something to key in on. Because having Matthews and Ertz as your main targets, you just key the middle of the field. It was easy. There's no... Th what threat did Doyle Green Beckham have to anyone when not in a car surrounded by Algar? That was a bad... I shouldn't say that. I'm very sorry. But that was a kind of true... Threat. I'm, it's a shame Doriel Green Beckham declined the way he did, but had more talent than sense, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, what what threat did he pose? He didn't. That was the thing. So it, I think now moving forward, you've got someone like Olshan who is going to benefit again from having such an open offense, but it depends on where Wentz targets. It depends on who's open. It depends on the play, the reads. And if they kind of write him in to, to be that number one guy, I don't know. It's going to be a very interesting narrative to watch. Pen that down, because I think that's going to be a very, very important thing come week eight, week nine, depending where the Eagles are in the standings. If they're not doing so great, that could be a major, major storyline. Um, thank you, next, Justin Letola. I hope I did that justice, and that wasn't... If it's just Letola, I'm going to feel really bad now. Um, but does the Sanders hammy concern me? Not really. I don't think his roster spot's any jeopardy, is it? He was, you know, drafted in the second round. It, it bothers me from a point that he's not there competing and getting ready and in shape and conditioning. But from a mental standpoint, he's still at every practice. He's still there taking the mental reps, just as Sidney Jones was doing. He was a second round pick as well with a much more serious injury. And um, even if you go into a year with Jordan Howard, Corey Clement, Wendell Smallwood, Boston, it's not the end of the world if Sanders has to theoretically redshot a year in the most extreme scenario. Uh, thank you. Next, uh, DJZ7777 says, if Miles Sanders is special, like Staley says, what does that what does that do for Carson, the offense and the cap going forward? Um, it just opens it up. The same way we speak about Ultra and Jeffrey opening up the offense, it, it presents a different threat. If you've got Jordan Howard for three, uh, for two downs, and then on third down you get Miles Sanders on the third and short, it changes the complexion of the offense. It changes the complexion of what linebackers are looking to do. Uh, are you having to monitor the flat? Are you going to have to kind of jam the gaps? It, it changes so much. So... It will be, again, something you can kind of interpret as the season goes on, as his role becomes a bit clearer. But it gives the Eagles a very different type of threat. In terms of the cap, we've got to remember that he's barely even a week into his rookie deal at this point. There's still a lot of room for Miles Sanders to grow into. So I wouldn't worry too much about the cap space for a while. In a best case scenario, it keeps the running back position cheap and cheerful. And that's seemingly the way the Eagles are going. Do you want to pay Zeke Elliott $15 million? Or would you rather have Jordan Howard on the last year of his contract? Miles Sanders on a rookie deal? That's the sort of debate you've got to have with backfields now. As the value of running back starts to be severely questioned by everyone ever, on analytics, Twitter especially, it's a very bizarre debate, but one that's worth having. And um, thank you next clever name says does anyone in the NFL have a better top to bottom roster than the Eagles? I don't see one. Oh that oh that that's tough. That's really really tough. I don't know. I I don't obviously I don't have them in front of me so that I don't want to kind of say anything on it. I don't want to say yes and then kind of ignore a blatant obvious. I like the Browns roster. I think that's a very, very competitive team. I think the New England Patriots are always good. There's a reason they've sustained that success for so long. But they make the scheme work around the talent as opposed to talent work around the scheme. Outside of those guys, I love the Colts. I love the Colts roster. The Falcons are good. Um, if they can stay healthy, the only thing stopping them from a potential NFC Championship game was health. 
The Saints roster again is very good. So they're, the Eagles are top five, certainly. You can argue that to the day's end. Same with the Rams. I think the Rams are up there. But if you want to say they're the best roster in the NFL top to bottom, there's a lot of arguments you've got to take in. I mean, the Chicago Bears could even be an argument realistically. If you, I know they're going to be a, a massive loss with Trubisky and stuff. Huh? But overall, you're saying top five. Top five roster safely. Maybe not the best, though. But... We are officially on the dot, 45 minutes in. We've come to the end of Thank You Next, and we've come to the end of this podcast. But before we let don't turn it on, don't turn it off. Don't you move just a muscle yet, sunshine. Sorry if you've just fallen asleep on a plane and I've woken you up. Wasn't my intention. But we can't let you go without giving you the Eagles Blockbusters clues one more time. So if you didn't write them down the first time, you're at the end of the show now. Here's the time to make a note. Question one. Along the trail, you'll find a stone. What play is that? Along the trail, you'll find a stone. Question two. Finding Nemo meets the Arsenal football team. Finding Nemo meets the Arsenal football team. And question three. I've heard that man's blind. What? Can't Jay's uncle see? I've heard that man's blind. What? Can't can't Jay's uncle see? Those are your three hints, your three cryptic clues for Eagles Blockbusters. Email me the correct three at phillysportsnetwork at gmail.com and you'll be entered to win a t-shirt next week. Congratulations to Connor. Kind of got to thank him again for the entry and for, you know, he's going to be giggling with that. I know he is. But thank you all for listening as well. It means the absolute world to me. I love doing these podcasts. I love doing all the stuff on YouTube. If you've got any ideas or stuff you want to see, spam away in the comments. Spam me on Twitter. From myself, Liam Jenkins, that Twitter is at Liam Jenkins PSN. I will see you very, very soon with some content on the Philly Sports Network YouTube channel. Or, of course, daily articles from myself at phillysportsnetwork.com. Pick your poison. Which one would you rather? I don't know. That's for you to decide. But have a great weekend, guys. I'll talk to you soon. In a metaphorical way, I do converse by myself. And I've also just discovered I can't end podcasts.